Chapter 6 of Clover. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Kalintout. Clover by Susan Coolidge. Chapter 6, St. Helens. Never in her life had Clover felt so small and incompetent and so very, very young as when the train with car 47 attached vanished from sight and left her on the platform of the Denver station with her two companions. There they stood, Phil on one side, tired and drooping, Mrs. Watson on the other, blinking anxiously about, both evidently depending on her for guidance and direction. For one moment, a sort of pale consternation swept over her. Then the sense of the inevitable and the nobler sense of responsibility came to her aid. She rallied herself, the colour returned to her cheeks, and she said bravely to Mrs. Watson, Now, if you and Phil will just sit down on that seat over there and make yourselves comfortable, I will find out about the trains for St. Helens and where we had better go for the night. Mrs. Watson and Phil seated themselves accordingly, and Clover stood for a moment, considering what she should do. Outside was a wilderness of tracks, up and down, which trains were puffing, in obedience, doubtless to some law understood by themselves, but which looked to the uninitiated like the direst confusion. Inside the station, the scene was equally confused. Travellers just arrived and just going away were rushing in and out. Porters and baggage agents, with their hands full, hurried to and fro. No one seemed at leisure to answer a question or even listen to one. Just then she caught sight of a shrewd yet good-natured face, looking at her from the window of the ticket office, and without hesitation she went up to the enclosure. It was the ticket agent whose eyes she had caught. He was at liberty at the moment, and his answers to her inquiries, though brief, were polite and kind. People generally did soften to Clover. There was such an odd and pretty contrast between her girlish appealing look and her dignified little manner, like a child trying to be stately but only succeeding in being primely sweet. The next train for St. Helens left at nine in the morning, it seemed, and the ticket agent recommended the Sherman House as a hotel where they would be very comfortable for the night. The omnibus is just outside, he said encouragingly. You'll find it a first-class house. Best there is west of Chicago. From the east? Just so. You've not seen our opera house yet, I suppose. Denver folks are rather proud of it. Biggest in the country, except the one in New York. Hope you'll have time to visit it. I should like to, said Clover, but we are here for only one night. My brother's been ill, and we are going directly on to St. Helens. I'm very much obliged to you. Her look of pretty, honest gratitude seemed to touch the heart of the ticket man. He opened the door of his fastness and came out, actually came out, and with a long, shrill whistle summoned a porter whom he addressed as, Here, you pat, and bade, Take these ladies' things and put them in the bus for the Sherman. Look sharp now and see that she's all right. Then to Clover, You'll find it very comfortable at the Sherman, miss, and I hope you'll have a good night. If you'll come to me in the morning, I'll explain about the baggage transfer. Clover thanked this obliging being again and rejoined her party, who were patiently sitting where she had left them. Dear me, said Mrs. Watson as the omnibus rolled off, I had no idea that Denver was such a large place. Street cars too. Well, I declare. And what nice shops, said Clover, equally surprised. Her ideas had been rather vague as to what was to be expected in the close neighbourhood of the Rocky Mountains. But she knew that Denver had only existed a few years and was prepared to find everything looking rough and unfinished. Why, they have restaurants here and jewellers' shops, she cried. Look, Phil, what a nice grocery. We needn't have packed all those oatmeal biscuits if only we had known. And electric lights, how wonderful. But of course, St. Helens is quite different. Their amazement increased when they reached the hotel and were taken in a large dining room to order dinner from a bill of fare which seemed to include every known luxury, from Oregon salmon and Lake Superior whitefish to frozen sherbets and California peaches and apricots. But wonderment yielded to fatigue, and again, as Clover fell asleep, she was conscious of a deep depression. What had she undertaken to do? How could she do it? But a night of sound sleep, followed by such a morning of unclouded brilliance, as is seldom seen east of Colorado, banished these misgivings. Courage rose under the stimulus of such air and sunshine. I must just live for each day as it comes, said little Clover to herself. Do my best as things turn up, keep Phil happy, and satisfy Mrs. Watson, if I can, and not worry about tomorrow's or yesterday's. That is the only safe way, and I won't forget it if I can help it. With these wise resolves, she ran downstairs, looking so blight and bright that Phil cheered at the sight of her, and lost the long morning face he had got up with, while even Mrs. Watson caught the contagion and became fairly hopeful and content. 
A little leaven of good will and good heart in one often avails to lighten the heaviness of many. The distance between Denver and St Helens is less than a hundred miles, but as the railroad has to climb and cross a range of hills between two and three thousand feet high, the journey occupies several hours. As the train gradually rose higher and higher, the travellers began to get wide views, first of the magnificent panorama of mountains which lies to the northwest of Denver, sixty miles away, with Long's Peak in the middle, and after crossing the crest of the divide, where a blue little lake rimmed with wildflowers sparkled in the sun of the more southern ranges. After a while, they found themselves running parallel to a mountain chain of strange and beautiful forms, green almost to the top, and intersected with deep ravines and cliffs which the conductor informed them were canyons. They seemed quite near at hand, for their bases sank into low rounded hills covered with woods. These melted into undulating tablelands, and those again into a narrow strip of park-like plain across which ran the track. Flowers innumerable grew on this plain, mixed with grass of a tawny brown green. There were cactuses, red and yellow, scarlet and white gilias, tall spikes of yucca in full bloom, and masses of a superb white poppy with an orange-brown centre, whose blue-green foliage was prickly like that of the thistle. Here and there on the higher uplands appeared strange rock shapes of red and pink and pale yellow, which looked like castles with towers and pinnacles, or like primitive fortifications. Clover thought it all strangely beautiful, but Mrs. Watson found fault with it as queer. It looks unnatural somehow, she objected. Not a bit like the East. Red never was a favourite colour of mine. Ellen had a magenta bonnet once, and it always worried, but Henry liked it, so of course people can't see the same way. Now the green hat she had winter before last was, don't you think those mountains are dreadfully bright and distinct? I don't like such high-coloured rocks. Even the green looks red somehow. I like soft, hazy mountains like Blue Hill and watches it. Ellen spent a summer up in Princeton once. It was when little Cynthia had diphtheria. She's named after me, you know. And Henry, he thought, but I don't like the staring kind like these. And somehow, those buildings, which the conductor says are not buildings but rocks, make my flesh creep. They'd be scrumptious places to repel attacks of Indians from, observed Phil. Two or three scouts with breech loaders up on that scarlet wall there could keep up a hundred Paiutes. I don't feel that way a bit, Clover was saying to Mrs. Watson. I like the colour. It's so rich, and I think the mountains are perfectly beautiful. If St. Helens is like this, I'm going to like it, I know. St. Helens, when they reached it, proved to be very much like this, only more so, as Phil remarked. The little settlement was built on a low plateau facing the mountains, and here the plain narrowed, and the beautiful range, seen through the clear atmosphere, seemed only a mile or two away, though in reality it was eight or ten. To the east, the plain widened again into grape upland suites, like the Kentish Downs, with here and there a belt of black woodland, and here and there a line of low bluffs. Viewed from a height, with the cloud shadows sweeping across it, it had the extent and splendour of the sea, and looked very much like it. The town, seen from below, seemed a larger place than Clover had expected, and again she felt the creeping, nervous feeling come over her. But before the train had fairly stopped, a brisk, active little man jumped on board, and walking into the car, began to look about him with keen, observant eyes. After one sweeping glance, he came straight to where Clover was collecting her bags and parcels, held out his hand, and said in a pleasant voice, I think this must be Miss Carr. I am Dr. Hope, he went on. Your father telegraphed me when you were to leave Chicago, and I have come down to two or three trains in hope of meeting you. Have you indeed, said Clover with a rush of relief. How very kind of you, and so Papa telegraphed. I never thought of that. Phil, here is Dr. Hope, Papa's friend. Dr. Hope, Mrs. Watson. This is a really very agreeable attention, you're coming to meet us, said Mrs. Watson. A very agreeable attention indeed. Well, I shall write Ellen, that's my daughter, Mrs. Phillips. You know, that before we had got out of the cars, a gentleman, and though I've always been in the habit of going about a good deal, it's always been in the east, of course, and things are... What are you going to do first, Dr. Hope? Miss Carr has a great deal of energy for a girl. But naturally, I suppose there's a hotel at St. Helens. Ellen is rather particular where I stay. At your age, mother, you must be made comfortable, whatever it costs, she says. And so I, an only daughter, you know. But you'll attend to all those things for us now, Doctor. There's quite a good hotel, said Dr. Hope, his eyes twinkling a little. I'll show it to you as we drive up. You'll find it very comfortable if you prefer to go there. But for these young people, I've taken rooms at a boarding house, a quieter and less expensive place. I thought it was what your father would prefer, he added in a low tone to Clover. I'm sure he would, she replied, but Mrs. Watson broke in. Oh, I shall go wherever Miss Carr goes. She's under my care, you know. 
though at the same time I must say that in the long run I have generally found the most expensive places turn out the cheapest. As Ellen often says, get the best and what do they charge at this hotel that you speak of, Dr. Hope? The Shoshone House? About $25 a week, I think, if you make a permanent arrangement. That is a good deal, remarked Mrs. Watson meditatively, while Clover hastened to say, it's a great deal more than Phil and I could spend, Dr. Hope. I'm glad you have chosen the other place for us. I suppose it is better, admitted Mrs. Watson, but when they gained the top of the hill and a picturesque, many-gabled, many balcony structure was pointed out at the Shoshone, her regrets returned, and she began again to murmur that often the most expensive places turned out the cheapest in the end, and that it stood to reason that they must be the best. Dr. Hope encouraged this view and proposed that she should stop and look at some rooms. But no, she could not desert her young charges and would go on, though at the same time she must say that her opinion as an older person who had seen more of the world was she was used to being consulted. Why, Addie Phillips wouldn't order that crushed strawberry bengaline of hers till Mrs Watson saw the sample. And, but girls had their own ideas and were bound to carry them out. Ellen always said so, and for her part, she knew her duty and meant to do it. Dr Hope flashed one rapid, comical look at Clover. Western life sharpens the wits if it does nothing else, and Westerners, as a general thing, become pretty good judges of character. It had not taken ten minutes for the keen-witted little doctor to fathom the peculiarities of Clover's chaperone, and he would most willingly have planted her in the congenial soil of the Shoshone house, which would have provided a wider field for her restlessness and self-occupation, and many more people to listen to her narratives and sympathise with her complaints. But it was no use. She was resolved to abide by the fortunes of her young friends. While this discussion was proceeding, the carriage had been rolling down a wide street running along the edge of the plateau, opposite the mountain range. Pretty houses stood on either side in green, shaded dooryards with roses and vine-hung piazzas and nicely cut grass. Why, it looks like a New England town, said Clover amazed. I thought there were no trees here. Yes, I know, said Dr. Hope smiling. You came, like most eastern people, prepared to find us sitting in the middle of a sandy waste on cactus pincushions, picking our teeth with bowie knives and with no neighbours but Indians and grizzly bears. Well, sixteen years ago we could have filled the bill pretty well. Then there was not a single house at St Helens, not even a tent, and not one of the trees that you see here had been planted. Now we have three railroads meeting at our depot, a population of nearly 7,000, electric lights, telephones, a good opera house, a system of works which brings first-rate spring water into the town from six miles away. In short, pretty much all the modern conveniences. But what has made this place grow so fast? asked Clover. If I may be allowed a professional pun, it is built up on coughings. It is a town for invalids. Half the people here came out for the benefit of their lungs. Isn't that rather depressing? It would be more so if most of them did not look so well that no one would suspect them of being ill. Here we are. Clover looked out eagerly. There was nothing picturesque about the house at whose gate the carriage had stopped. It was a large shabby structure with a piazza above as well as below. And on these piazzas, various people were sitting who looked unmistakably ill. The front of the house, however, commanded the fine mountain view. You see, explained Dr. Hope, drawing Clover aside, boarding places that are both comfortable and reasonable are rather scarce at St. Helens. I know all about the table here and the drainage, and the view is desirable, and Mrs. Marsh, who keeps the house, is one of the best women we have. She's from down your way, too, Barnstable, Mass, I think. Clover privately wondered how Barnstable Mass could be classified as down the same way with Burnet, not having learned as yet that the soaring western mind, that insignificant fraction of a whole country known as the East, means anywhere from Maine to Michigan, and that such trivial geographical differences as exist between the different sections seem scarcely worth consideration when compared with the vast spaces which lie beyond toward the setting sun. But perhaps Dr. Hope was only trying to tease her, for he twinkled amusedly at her puzzled face as he went on. I think you could make yourself comfortable here. It was the best I could do. But your old lady would be much better suited at the Shoshone. I wish she'd go there. Clover couldn't help laughing. I wish that people wouldn't persist in calling Mrs. Watson my old lady, she thought. Mrs. Marsh, a pleasant-looking person, came to meet them as they entered. She showed Clover and Phil to their rooms, which had been secured for them, and then carried Mrs. Watson off to look at another, which she could have if she liked. The rooms were on the third floor, a big front one for Phil, with a sunny south window, and two others looking towards the west and the mountains, and, opening from it, a smaller room for Clover. Your brother ought to live in fresh air both indoors and out, said Dr. Hope, and I thought this large room would answer as a sort of sitting place for you. It's ever so nice, and we are both more obliged to you than we can say, replied Clover, holding out her hand as the doctor rose to go. He gave a pleased little laugh as he shook it. 
That's all right, he said. I owe your father's children any good turn in my power, for he was a good friend to me when I was a poor boy just beginning and needed friends. That's my house with the red roof, Miss Clover. You see how near it is? And please remember that besides the care of this boy here, I'm in charge of you too, and have the inside track on the rest of the friends you are going to make in Colorado. I expect to be called on whenever you want anything or feel lonesome or are at a loss in any way. My wife is coming to see you as soon as you have had your dinner and got settled a little. She sent those to you, indicating a vase on the table filled with flowers. They were a sort of which Clover had never seen before. Deep cup-shaped blossoms of beautiful pale purple and white. Oh, what are they? She called after the doctor. Anemones, he answered and was gone. What a dear, nice, kind man, cried Clover. Isn't it delightful to have a friend right off who knows Papa and does things for us because we are Papa's children? You like him, don't you, Phil? And don't you like your room? Yes, only it doesn't seem fair that I should have the largest. Oh yes, it is perfectly fair. I shall never want to be in mine except when I am dressing or asleep. I shall sit here with you all the time. And isn't it lovely that we have these enchanting mountains before our eyes? I never saw anything in my life that I like so much as I do that one. It was Cheyenne Mountain, at which she pointed, the last of the chain, and set a little apart, as it were, from the others. There is as much difference between mountains as between people, as mountain lovers know, and like people, they present characters and individualities of their own. The noble lines of Mount Cheyenne are full of strange dignity, but it is dignity mixed with the indefinable charm. The candles nestle about its base, as children at a parent's knee. Its cheddar forests clothe it like drapery, it lifts its head to the dawn and the sunset, and the sun seems to love it best of all, and lies longer on it than on the other peaks. Clover did not analyse her impressions, but she fell in love with it at first sight, and loved it better and better all the time that she stayed at St Helens. Dr Hope and Mount Cheyenne were our first friends in the place, she used to say in after days. How nice it is to be by ourselves, said Phil, as he lay comfortably on the sofa watching Clover unpack. I get so tired of being all the time with people. Dear me, the room looks quite homelike already. Clover had spread a pretty towel over the bare table, laid some books and her writing case upon it, and was now pinning up a photograph over the mantelpiece. We'll make it nice by and by, she said cheerfully. And now that I've tied it up a little, I think I'll go and see what becomes of Mrs. Watson. She'll think I have quite forgotten her. You'll lie quiet and rest till dinner, won't you? Yes, said Phil, who looked very sleepy. I'm all right for an hour to come. Don't hurry back if the ancient female wants you. Clover spread a shawl over him before she went and shut one of the windows. We won't have you catching cold the very first morning, she said. That would be a bad story to send back to Papa. She found Mrs. Watson in very low spirits about her room. It's not that it's small, she said. I don't need a very big room, but I don't like being poked away at the back so. I've always had a front room all my life, and at Ellen's in the summer I have a corner chamber and see the sea and everything. It's an elegant room, solid black walnut with marble tops, and lighthouses too. I have three of them in view, and they are really company for me on dark nights. I don't want to be fussy, but really, to look out on nothing but a side yard with some trees, and they aren't elms or anything that I'm used to, but a new kind. There's a thing out there too, that I never saw before, which looks like one of those giant ants' nests of Africa in Morse's geography that I used to read about when I was... It makes me really nervous. Clover went to the window to look for the mysterious object. It was a cone-shaped thing of white unburned clay, which you she could not guess. She found later that it was a receptacle for ashes. I suppose your rooms are front ones, went on Miss Watson querulously. Mine isn't. It's quite a little one at the side. I think it must be just under this. Phil's is in front, a nice large one with the view of the mountains. I wish there were one just like it for you. The doctor says it's very important for him to have a great deal of air in his room. Doctors always say that. And of course, Dr. Hope, being a friend of yours and all, it's quite natural he should give you the preference. Though the Phillips are accustomed, but there, it's no use. Only, as I tell Ellen, Boston is the place for me, where my family is known, and people realise what I'm used to. I'm so sorry, Clover said again. Perhaps somebody will go away, and Mrs. Marsh have a front room for you before long. She did say that she might. I suppose she thinks some of her boarders will be dying off. In fact, there is one, that tall man in grey in the reclining chair, who didn't seem to me likely to last long. Well, we will hope for the best. I'm not one who likes to make difficulties. This prospect, together with dinner, which was presently announced, raised Mrs Watson's spirits a little, and Clover left her in the parlour, exchanging experiences and discussing symptoms with some ladies who had sat opposite them at the table. Mrs Hope came for a call, a pretty little woman, as friendly and kind as her husband. 
Then Clover and Phil went out for a stroll about the town. Their wonder increased at every turn, that a place so well equipped and complete in its appointments could have been created out of nothing in fifteen years was a marvel. After two or three turns they found themselves among shops, whose plate glass windows revealed all manner of wares, confectionery, new books, pretty glass and china, bonnets of the latest fashion. One or two large pharmacies glittered with jars, purple and otherwise, enough to tempt any number of Rosamonds. Handsome carriages drawn by fine horses rolled past them, with well-dressed people inside. In short, St. Helens was exactly like a thriving eastern town, of double its size, with the difference that here a great many more people seemed to ride than drive. Someone cantered past every moment, a lady alone, two or three girls together, or a party of rough-looking men in long boots, or a single ranchman sitting loose in his stirrups and swinging a stock whip. Clover and Phil were standing on a corner, looking at some rocky mountain curiosities displayed for sale. Minerals, Pueblo poetry, stuffed animals and Indian blankets, and Phil had just commented on the beauty of a black horse which was tied to a post close by, when its rider emerged from a shop and prepared to mount. He was a rather good-looking young fellow, sunburnt and not very tall, but with a lithe, active figure, red-brown eyes and a long moustache of tawny chestnut. He wore spurs and a broad-brimmed sombrero, and carried in his hand a whip which seemed two-thirds lash. As he put his foot into the stirrup, he turned for another look at Clover, whom he had rather stared at while passing, and then changing his intention, took it out again and came toward them. I beg your pardon, he said, but aren't you, isn't it Clover Carr? Yes, said Clover, wondering, but still without the least notion as to whom the stranger might be. You've forgotten me? went on the young man with a smile which made his face very bright. That's rather hard too, for I knew you at once. I suppose I'm a good deal changed, though. Perhaps I shouldn't have made you out except for your eyes. They're just the same. Why, Clover, I'm your cousin, Clarence Page. Clarence Page? cried Clover joyfully. Not really. Why, Clarence, I never should have known you in the world, and I can't think how you came to know me. I was only fourteen when I saw you last, and you were quite a little boy. What well, good luck that we should meet, and on our first day, too. Someone wrote that you were in Colorado, but I had no idea that you lived at St. Helens. I don't, not much. I'm living on a ranch out that way, jerking his elbow towards the northwest. But I ride in often to get the mail. Have you just come? You said the first day. Yes, we only got here this morning. And this is my brother Phil. Don't you recollect how I used to tell you about him at Ashburn? I should think you did, shaking hands cordially. She used to talk about you all the time, so that I felt intimately acquainted with all the family. Well, I call this first-rate luck. It's two years since I saw anyone from home. Home? Well, the East, you know. It all seems like home when you're out here. And I mean anyone that I know, of course. People from the East come out all the while. They are as thick as bumblebees at St. Helens, but they don't amount to much unless you know them. Have you seen anything of Mother and Lily since they got back from Europe, Clover? No, indeed, I haven't seen them since we left Hillsover. Katie has, though. She met them in Nice when she was there, and they sent her a wedding present. You knew that she was married, didn't you? Yes, I got her cards. Pa sent them. He writes oftener than the others do, and he came out once and stayed a month on the ranch with me. That was while Mother was in Europe. Where are you stopping? The Shoshone, I suppose? No, a quieter place. Mrs. Marsh's, on the same street. Oh, I know Mother Marsh. I went there when I first came out, and had caught the mountain fever. She was ever so kind to me. I'm glad you're there. She's a nice woman. How far away is your ranch? About sixteen miles. Oh, I say, Clover, you and Phil must come out and stay with us sometime this summer. We'll have a round-up for you, if you will. What is a round-up, and who is us? said Clover, smiling. Well, a round-up is a kind of general muster of the stock. All the animals are driven in and counted, and the young ones branded. It's pretty exciting sometimes, I can tell you, for the cattle get wild, and it's all we can do to manage them. You should see some of our boys ride. It's splendid. And there's one half-breed that's the best hand of the lasso I ever saw. Phil will like it, I know, and us is me and my partner. Have you a partner? Yes, two, in fact but one of them lives in New Mexico just now, so he does not count. That's Bert Talcott. He's a New York fellow. The other's English, a Devonshire man. Jeff Templestow is his name. Is he nice? You can just bet your pa that he is, said Clarence, who seemed to have assimilated Western slang with the rest of the West. Wait till I bring him to see you. We'll come in on purpose some day soon. Well, I must be going. Goodbye, Clover. Goodbye, Phil. It's awfully jolly to have you here. I never should have guessed who it was, remarked Clover, as they watched the active figure canter down the street and turn for a last flourish of the hat. He was the roughest, scrubbiest boy when we last met. What a fine-looking fellow he has grown to be, and how well he rides. 
No wonder. A fellow who can have a horse whenever he has mine to, said Phil enviously. Life on a ranch must be great fun, I think. Yes, in one way, but pretty rough and lonely too sometimes. It would be nice to go out and see Clarence's, if we can get some lady to go with us, won't it? Well, just don't let it be Mrs. Watson, whoever it is. She would spoil it all if she went. Now, Philly, don't. We're supposed to be leaning on her for support. Oh, come on, lean on that old thing. Why, she couldn't support a postage stamp standing edgewise, as the man says in the play. Do you suppose I don't know you have to look out for her and do everything? She's not a bit of use. Yes, but you and I have got to be politer to her, Philly. We mustn't forget that. Oh, I'll be polite enough if she will just leave us alone, retorted Phil. Promising. End of chapter 6